introduce to you our host, Susan Barger. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're gl glad to see you all here and see people signing in. Um, I have a few slides. The best way to keep in touch uh, with us is, is to use the CTCC announce list. It's just a listserv. It's for announcements only. Usually it's only um, one or two announcements a, a month, but um, there have been quite a lot lately because there are a lot of ch um, changes going on. So, um, but if, if you want to be part of that listserv, just sign in and and uh, you can join. If you need help uh, during a disaster, you can call this 24-hour uh, hotline to get the National Heritage Responders. I know we have several uh, storms and hurricanes going on and fires, so keep that uh, line uh, in mind. Our um, forum has changed. Our discussion forum has, has changed. It's now on this new platform. And so if you, even if you were on the old forum, you still need to join the new one. And that's where you can ask questions about collections care. And a nice conservative will help give you answers that are reliable and quick So, um, and that are geared for our audience, which is small and mid-sized cultural institutions. So you can go to this. Uh, uh, link on our website and learn how to join the new community. Um, you can always contact me. This is my email address. I'm happy to hear from people, um, good, bad, or indifferent. So please go ahead and use that. And uh, next month, we have two webinars. The first one is about feathers. And um, so it will deal with caring for feathers and also uh, legal issues with feathers. And we are also um, have um, courses starting. And our first course uh, begins uh, at the end of October. The courses cost money, unlike our webinars. And don't worry, our webinars are still going to continue, and they'll still be free. Um, if you register early for the course, there are discounts. And you can find information on how to uh, register for the course um, on our website by clicking on this slide. And so now we're going to go right over to our speakers today. So take it away, Karen and John. There we go. All right, hello, everyone. Um, I will say I have uh, a bit of a technical difficulty. So if I could have someone advance the slide for me. Um, I will do my introduction, and then I'm going to pop out and see if I can get back in to control the slides. Thank you. Um, so my name is Karen Butler-Clary. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for participating in the webinar. I know we all have many hats that we wear and a lot of responsibilities. Um, so I just appreciate everyone spending a little time with us today. I am currently at the University of Denver. I work in the Beck Archives. So like any good collection professional, I am in a small room with no windows, but that is where you will find me. My background is in art history, and I've also got a degree in museum studies, both from University of Kansas, which is where I got the opportunity to meet John and learn from him and work with him. So throughout my career, I've got about 10 years of experience in museums and cultural nonprofits. I've always hung out with the collections, doing uh, collections management and registration, and a surprising amount of data entry. Um, and perhaps I am a glutton for punishment because I have decided to go and get another degree now, too. Um, working in an archive that's actually part of a university library has just kind of sparked an interest in understanding how the library works a little bit better. So I am also a student again at the University of Denver. Uh, working on a master's in library and information science. And I will have someone advance for me to have John introduce himself. Hi there. Uh, my name is John Simmons. <clears throat> I'm a museum consultant based in uh, central Pennsylvania. But I also serve as the adjunct curator of collections at the Earth and Mineral Sciences Museum and Art Gallery at Penn State University. 
Although I started my professional career as a zookeeper, I at this point have more than 40 years of experience in museums as a collection manager and a, and a consultant. Uh, I'm currently on the board of ARCS, the Association of Registrars and Collection Specialists, and I'm in my last year as chairperson of the Collection Stewardship Professional Network of the American Alliance of Museums. And like uh, Karen, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the seminar, to the webinar, and thank you all for participating. I believe we have some poll questions now. And John, I'm going to have you go ahead and lead those since I am still okay. having trouble. Okay, no problem. So we have we have uh, four different questions up at the same time. So number one is what, what size institution do you work for? And, and these are based on budget just to give us an idea of who's the audience. Uh, number two is what type of collection do you care for? And we tried to uh, group these up into general groups, so please pick the one that is most like what you have, and there is a category for other. Uh, question number three is where do you get most of your collection care information? And we're curious about this before we get started into the, uh, into the meat of the webinar. And our, our, our last poll question, number four, is how often do you participate in professional development opportunities? And we will let you define what a professional development opportunity is, but we would include uh, webinars and things like that. So it looks like we've got some results coming in. It looks like most of you appear to be in medium or large collections. This is an overwhelming number of people that are in art collections. Uh, looks like there's a people are beginning to favor uh, the internet as a source for collection care information, and it looks like most of you do participate in professional development opportunities uh, several times a year, which is very good. And that's one thing I've always liked about the museum profession is that we are encouraged to uh, do continuing education as we go through. So I'll give people just a, a, another minute or two to uh, deal with the poll questions, and then we will move on. Karen, are you able to control the slides now? I am not. I am only able to log in as a as a visitor and not a presenter. Oh, okay. Well, I I can I think I can run things while you're talking. So. Oh, here we go, and I'm back. Fantastic. Okay, very good. All right. <clears throat> so thank you all for taking the time to do the polls. So we'll start out with what are we going to talk about today. And uh, what we're going to do is talk about where you can find good information on the care of collections and what are good collection care resources. There is a lot of information available, both in print and online, but not all of it is very reliable. Liable. So we're going to try to give you some ways to help you figure out how to separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, we'll also give you our personal list of essential references and some tips for connecting to local, regional, national, and international collection care communities. And of course, this is one of those topics that everyone has an opinion about, and everyone is probably uh, equally right in their opinion. So this is uh, the opinion of Karen and I. And I believe the screen uh, just disappeared from my view. Uh, I'm not sure how to get that back. I, I have a screen up that says, share my screen. Yeah, that, that's also what I'm seeing. OK. Um, we'll get Mike to take care of that. and. Uh, I'm sure he will get it fixed in one moment. So there are three basic categories of sources for collections care information. The oldest is the traditional way that we learn things, and that is we learn on the job by talking to our colleagues. And so you might call this the oral tradition of museum work. And of course, part of that is still very important because we pick up the cultural memory of our institutions that way. 
Uh, originally, this oral tradition of museum work was limited to the very few people who one museum worker might encounter at work. But the oral tradition with the internet is now much broader because we can now pick up information from people that we don't actually work with uh, via listservs and websites. The second category is probably the best known, and this is the publications, which historically meant things that were in print, such as books, uh, journal articles and pamphlets, but there's a fair amount of published information now that is in electronic form only. So publication uh, no longer just means things printed on paper, but things that are made public, including through the internet. And then this brings us to our category number three of information. This is the information that we get through the internet from web pages and wiki pages and how-to videos and webinars uh, like the one we're doing now. So I, I still don't have uh, slides up, and I don't know if our participants do or not. So I don't want to get too far. Okay, I don't want to get too far in advance of our slides. So we'll give uh, um, give Mike, Mike a moment. Mike working to, on it. Yeah, I'll give Mike a moment to see if he can he can get this uh, restored here. Yeah. OK, so I see some of the people are saying they have no slides either. So I'm, we'll get this back up in just a moment. OK, it looks like we're slowly getting it coming back up. This is, of course, one of the uh, great things about the internet is it works really well when it works. There we go. So we are back. So these are our, our, uh, what we're going to talk about today. And we just discussed our three types of resources. And this brings us to where do we find the most credible information. And it would be nice if we could just trust all three of these sources, the things we learn from our colleagues, what's published in print media, and what's on the web. But unfortunately, we can't. Uh, good information can come from all three, but we can. you can also get uh, information that isn't very good. And what we're going to focus on in this webinar, you might think of as the place where all these meet in this Venn diagram. This is this overlap between information from colleagues, publications, and web, and web resources, information that is supported from uh, many other sources, all three sources. And so before we get into these contemporary sources, we need to take a quick look at the history of uh, museum information to see where it came from. I think it's always important to know where we have come from in order to chart the course about where we are going. So the collections are much older than museums. They predate museums by thousands of years. And in that sense, collections have always been cared for, just sometimes not very well. And if they had been well cared for, of course, our collections would be even larger than they are today. The basic principles of collection management go back to the early 1700s with the birth of what we would recognize as the modern museum. <clears throat> the first comprehensive book on managing collections was published in 1727 by Caspar Nickel, which was a pseudonym for a dealer in museum objects named Caspar Frederick Jenkel. The book was written in German. I will not attempt to pronounce the German name, but the English translation was Museography or Instructions for the Better Understanding and Useful Organization of Museums in Chambers of Rarities. And this tells us several things. The fact that there was a book published means there were a lot of museums around, many of which are now gone. And it also tells us that there was concern among the people that ran these museums in maintaining their collections in the long term. The book was really an impressive undertaking because even at this early date of 1727, it provided guidelines for the acquisition and organization of objects as well as for collections care. Some of the advice in the book sounds very basic to us today, but was probably groundbreaking at that time, such as the need to maintain an accession book and a catalog, the need to store objects in dry conditions and protect them from sunlight. And it was even suggested in this book that you put a table in the center of the room where objects could be examined to minimize the handling of the objects. So those are all fairly advanced ideas. 
The next big breakthrough came about in 1753 when a man named David Holtman, who had been a student of Linnaeus, the uh, gentleman who invented uh, binomial nomenclature that we use in scientific collections, published a book on collection, uh, collections care. That the title was in Latin. It roughly translates as Instructions for the Natural Museum. His book recommended that museum buildings be made of brick so that they are fire resistant, because at that time, making buildings out of material that couldn't burn was the best they could do to avoid fires. He also recommended the buildings be longer than wide with north-facing windows, so that rather than getting direct sunlight into the building, you got indirect light. At this time, uh, museums were run by private collectors, and the bulk of the work of cleaning the objects and arranging them was usually delegated to fairly lowly assistants whose only training was training on the job. Most of the early museum manuals then focus on how-to instructions, and many of these how-to instructions would make us flinch today, but this was long before the idea of preventive conservation had been developed. There were a number of other books published, mostly in Europe, uh, over the next century or so, but they didn't really add a lot to what was already known at that time. The basic message was to keep collection objects dry and keep them out of direct sunlight. Training for museum work is uh, another big issue. The collections care profession, as a profession, got started in the 20th century, so it's fairly new. And this is when training for museum work became more formal. The first training course for museum workers in the United States was started in 1908. Uh, and this sort of formal training for the museum profession did not really become common until the 1970s when museum studies programs began to appear at American universities. And I love this photograph. Uh, this is the newly trained museum professionals coming out of one of the early uh, training programs at the Newark Museum in 1926, all ready to go out and work in the profession. Another important factor in developing resources for collection care was the formation of <clears throat> museum organizations that shared information about collection care among their members. The American Association of Museums, which is now, of course, the American Alliance of Museums, or AAM, was founded in 1906 specifically to advance professional standards. And there were similar organizations started in a number of other countries. The AAM began publishing its first journal in 1918. It was called a museum work. It later became Museum News and is now just called Museum. The American Association for State and Local History, the AASLH, was founded in 1940. In 1946, the first significant international museum organization, the International Council of Museums, or ICOM, was established. And the American Institute for the Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, uh, commonly known as the AIC, was founded uh, much more recently in 1972. The following this, the next big thing was the, the appearance of more modern publications. And the next really major step in the care of museum collections, and probably one of the most profound, was the publication in 1958 of Museum Registration Methods. And this was written by Dorothy Dudley, who was a registrar at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and Irma Bezold Wilkinson, who was a registrar at the Newark Museum. And so this was the first edition. This book played a major role in defining the profession and defining, and defining what were professional uh, standards and best practices in museums. This book is now in its fifth edition, which came out in 2010. And it's now called, it's still called Museum Registration Methods. The fifth edition is called MRM5. And it is, has become the standard reference in the care and management of museum collections. Some other significant publications in the United States include Introduction to Museum Work uh, by George Burkhaw in 1975, and Registration Methods for the Small Museum by Daniel Rabel, uh, which was first published in 1978. So these are some of the, the founding publications that, that really put museum collections care on the map and, and united us all as a profession. The next big game changer in this was the uh, publication of Gary Thompson's book, The Museum Environment, in 1978. And it's probably best known from its second edition from 1986. 
uh, this book had a profound impact by emphasizing the importance of maintaining and monitoring stable storage environments. It was, of course, known before then that the environment affected the objects. But Thompson was the first that could really put numbers on this and give us some really good guidance to it. And this stimulated the incorporation of the principles of preventive conservation as a basic part of collections management. So these are some of the, the major publications that have come about over the years. The next one I'd like to mention is uh, a one that only tangentially relates to what we're talking about today. And But this is the breakthrough publication of Marie Malaro's Legal Primer on Managing Museum Collections, which was first published in 1998 and is now in a third edition published with Il De Angelis. And so this is another one that addresses, uh, emphasizes the legal obligations of museums to take care of their collections and is another one that you'll find on most list of uh, collection care workers standard bookshelf. Well, the profession is continuing to advance. And the American Alliance of Museums has taken the lead in trying to establish standards for US museums. Their first publication of, for this came out in 2008 in the, in the book National Standards and Best Practices for US Museums. And section four deals with collection stewardship. The collection uh, care recommendations are still rather general. I hope that AAM will proceed with this and put out more specific things, but at this point, uh, that is uh, all that has appeared in the United States. There is a similar publication that is available in, the, in Great Britain called Spectrum 4.0 that comes from Collections Trust, and this is available on the internet if you'd like to take a look and see what people in the UK are doing. Well, one thing you'll notice if you go back and review this literature is that the standards and recommendations for things like uh, museum collections uh, do change uh, over time. So why do these standards keep changing? Well, the main reason is that uh, we keep improving our knowledge of how to care for collections. The standards have evolved rapidly as we've learned more and more about how objects interact with their environment. And advances, advances in our knowledge of collections care are the result then of years of research, observation, and practice. And the more we learn about the interactions of objects with the environment, the better we understand how to use preventive conservation in our collection. So it's really important to keep up with the literature and know what, is, uh, what are current recommendations. And I'll give you an example. Back in the 1970s, the standard recommendation for most museums for a storage environment was maintain a steady 50% relative humidity at 68 degrees all year, all the time, which is nearly impossible unless you live in a very few climates where this, this can happen. The current recommendations are very different. For most materials now, a range of temperatures and humidities are recommended with the emphasis on reducing the fluctuations, but you might have one range of humidity and temperature in the summer and another one in the winter because of the problems of maintaining a steady one. And the reason for this is materials react interact uh, differently to the environment. This is a musical instrument from South America that's made out of wood, glue, hide and bone. It's got an armadillo shell on it. It has inlay and nylon strings. Well, all of these materials react differently to environmental changes. And we now recognize that most objects do best over a range of conditions rather than trying to hold them into these really narrow uh, frames. And this does not mean that the recommendations from the 1970s were wrong. It means that we have just learned more about uh, how to take care of things. So that's our caution, is to make sure when you do access uh, the literature and older information that it is still uh, valid information. So <clears throat> the biggest change that has occurred, in my opinion, in collections care in the entire history of museums, which goes back quite a way, is the introduction of the principles of preventive conservation. And this goes back to the mid-1970s. Now, it's important to emphasize that collections management is not conservation, and conservation is not collection management, but the two are closely linked, and they share a large area of overlap in preventive conservation. So this is an area where those of us who are not conservators do need to uh, pay attention to what the conservators are doing and saying and apply this information to our work. So preventive conservation refers to the things that are done to prolong the useful life of the objects in the collections. The, the useful life means the life over which we can derive information from the objects and interpret them in, in our museums. Uh, 
Preventive conservation was developed when it became obvious that traditional uh, object-directed practices were not really showing, not really slowing down the deterioration of objects. So preventive conservation emphasizes the importance of stable storage environments, the identification and understanding of the agents of collection deterioration, and how to make the best use of the limited collection care resources that we have. And all of these work together as a holistic and integrated way to manage collections. So this is a pretty good definition of preventive conservation. Actions taken to minimize or slow the rate of deterioration and to prevent damage to collections. This includes activities such as risk management, development and implementation of guidelines for continuing use and care, appropriate environmental conditions for storage and exhibition, and proper procedures for handling, packing, transport, and use. These responsibilities may be shared by collection managers, conservators, subject specialists, curators, and other institutional uh, administrators. So we will go with that definition. That's uh, a relatively good one. So the goal of preventive conservation is to avoid deterioration of objects or at least slow that down as much as possible. One of the advantages is it's very cost effective compared to the expense of conservation treatments for individual objects after they have deteriorated. So you're better to spend the money up front to prevent the deterioration. Most preventive conservation major measures in collections care are involved in providing a good quality, stable storage environment for the collection. And by understanding the factors that cause collections to deteriorate, we can make better use of our collections care resources. So this brings us to these resources and how can we tell good resources from bad ones. So this is a time we can give you a few hints in this direction. And the first question I would ask is, what's the source? Is the source of this information that you're looking at from a peer-reviewed publication, for example, or is it something a friend told you? It's always better to check the source yourself because despite the best of intentions, our colleagues may leave out some factor or get information wrong. So we should never rely just on oral transmission of information. Did the information come from a website? If so, is it a website that's supported by professional museum organizations? Does the information sound too good to be true? If it does, it probably is too good to be true. Another criteria is, are you familiar with the source? Is is this an organization or a publisher that you're familiar with that is experienced in this area? If, if, is the source a for-profit company that is trying to sell you some product or technique? Generally, information from nonprofit museum organizations is more reliable than information from commercial sources, but there are some exceptions to this. The third category is who is the author? Is it a known professional or is it someone you've never heard of? If you're not familiar with the author or the source, this is the time when you need to really check with your colleagues and check around to make sure that the information is reliable. The last one is, does it sound reasonable based on what you have read and what you have experienced? Does the information follow the principles of, pre of preventive conservation? And you think about the ramifications of the recommendations. Are there mentions of chemicals that you know to be too acidic or too alkaline or procedures that you know are damaging or uh, materials that you know are not really inert that are recommended? Now, I'll give you some examples of bad information. I like to call this raw potatoes and whiteout because there are some traditions that are out there that these I've noticed that uh, this, a lot of this information, although it's long been debunked, is still around. One of them is you can label objects using a base coat of whiteout correction fluid and then write your number on it and coat it with clear nail polish. Uh, no, you can't. Uh, whiteout and clear nail polish are not stable materials. They will damage the object. They often cannot be removed, and they do not hold up over over time, and I keep hearing stories that this is taught in a particular program, although I have never been able to run down the source of this really bad information. Another one is that you can clean the surface of a painting with a raw potato. Just cut it in half and rub it on the painting. Well, a moist potato might remove some dirt, but it's also going to ruin the painting. It's going to cause abrasion. It's going to leave behind starch and other organic matter that causes deterioration, and using half a potato is really not a safe way to clean anything. 
Another one I hear frequently is that the database we use at our museum is the best. Uh, well, one, no one database is right for everyone. Uh, you can, for instance, list your collection information in Excel, but that doesn't make it a database. A good database will do far more than duplicate what you're doing with uh, pencil and paper. So in short, you should be extremely careful about these sorts of quick fixes found on the internet or passed along from person to person and be very suspicious of them. We have some handouts, which uh, I presume many of you have downloaded already. We have four of them. One is our list of basic print resources. Uh, another is basic online resources, some basic video and webinars, and museum professional organizations. We do not intend for these lists to be comprehensive. Instead, uh, these are the resources we think are, Karen and I, are most important to be familiar with. If you know of other resources that you think are worth adding to our list, we would request that you please send us an email after the workshop and let us know about them so we can check them out. We don't have time to discuss every resource on all four handouts, but we are going to explain a little bit about what is on each of the handouts as we go. And as I said, these are not intended to be comprehensive. You may know of a better source, and if so, let us know. So uh, there we go. Basic print resources. Uh, the number of useful museum publications has increased dramatically since 1980. Uh, I got my master's degree in museum studies back in the early 80s, and I remember how sparse the literature was at that time. Uh, you. Uh, those of you entering the field now are very lucky that this is a time of really rich resources. So we've attempted to list the most basic books that we find useful in collections care on our list. And of course, the first one is Buck and Gilmore's Museum Registration Methods, 5th edition. This is invaluable, fondly known as MRM5. It's more than 500 pages of work by 60 authors covering almost every phase of collection, acquisition, registration, and management. There is a new edition being prepared, which will be MRM6. And you know, we hope that will be published in sometime in late 2019 or early 2020. Another basic one uh, is that in museum work, we often run into hazardous materials, and sometimes without knowing they're hazardous. So we have included in our list Help and Safety for Museum Professionals, which was a joint production by the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works and the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. And this is another big, fat compendium of knowledge with multiple authors on museum safety issues. The Image Permanence Institute of Rochester Institute of Technology was founded in 1985 to do research on preserving images. But uh, it has extended its work to uh, pr preserving far more than images. To and it's now the largest independent laboratory devoted to preservation research. And you will probably notice their name appears on three of the four handouts because of the quantity of material they produce in both print and electronic publications, videos, and webinars. This includes uh, an image that you're seeing a screenshot of, which is their online dew point calculator. This is uh, really useful if you are concerned about a collection storage environment. And I have, in my experience, found it really useful when you need to talk to your building engineer or to a heating and cooling specialist, because this really gets the point across. This shows the relationship between temperature, relative humidity, dew point, and mold growth. And so this is really a really useful tool to play with. And I, I highly recommend you go to the, their website and take a look at it and play around with the numbers. They have a, a, a book, uh, IPI's Guide to Sustainable uh, Preservation Practices for Managing Storage Environments. It is also very useful. And it's based on a series of 12 webinars that are available for free on their website, along with a lot of other helpful stuff. So that's a good one to keep in mind. This is a, a fairly new publication, uh, Angela Kipp's Managing Previously Unmanaged Collections, a Practical Guide for Museums. Uh, we heartily recommend this. This was published in, uh, in 2016. And she has also done a webinar on the same topic that is available from the Connecting to Collections uh, website archives. And this is the book you need if you're confronted with a collection that has never been managed before or never been organized will help you through it. Or even if you are working with one that is only mildly uh, in shambles, it's, it's a big help. 
The legal aspects of managing collections can be daunting, but we have included two books that will help you figure out what to do and what not not to do. We've already mentioned the standard reference, A Legal Primer on Managing Museum Collections, the third edition. But we would also like to recommend uh, Caravella's book, A Legal Dictionary for Museum Professionals, which was published in 2016, which will help you understand some of the legal terms and concepts that are in the legal primer. I, I find this another uh, very useful book. And here we have your tax dollars at work. A lot of people don't know this, but the organization that has the largest museum collections in the United States is not the Smithsonian, but the Department of the Interior. The Smithsonian's 19 museums and galleries combined have about 154 million objects. The Department of the Interior has 202 million objects, housed in 1,720 collections and 910 partner institutions. So to manage their share of the stuff, the National Park Service has developed some really useful resources. Then this is your tax dollars at work. These resources are free and available uh, in PDF format. I think the most useful of these is the Conservagram series. These are short, focused articles on specific collection issues available as PDFs. There are currently 183 of them in 22 different categories. And these have all been vetted by conservation and collection management professionals, so the information is reliable. There is also the Museum Handbook, which is available in PDF format. A lot of the handbook is Park Service regulations that are not relevant to the average museum, but the rest of the information is very good. So if you skip over the part that has to do with Park Service regulation and that sort of thing, the information on uh, collection care is very good. And so both of these are available on the Park Service website. And I want to mention one publication that is actually not yet available. It uh, will be published later this year. And uh, this is Preventive Conservation Collection Storage, a, a new book coming out. It's going to be a little more than 800 pages long. It's a joint production of the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections, the American Institute for Conservation, the Smithsonian Institution, and George Washington University. It's edited by Lisa Elkin and Chris Norris, and we think this is going to be available uh, later this fall. And this will be an extremely useful book it addresses all sorts of collections and uh, storage issues related to them. In terms of basic online resources, uh, the list contains a lot of references. So once again, we're only going to mention a few of them here. We're not going to go over every reference. Online resources can be very good, but they can also be very bad. You need to pay close attention to the source and to the organization hosting information, who is responsible for it. Our list is very carefully selected to include only sites that we know from personal experience are reliable. Uh, just a few of these, the American Institute for Conservation uh, uh, publishes a print journal and an online journal for paying members, but it's a highly technical publication, so we're not including it here, but they do have a really useful conservation wiki and a series of brochures on caring for your treasures information on disaster preparedness, recovery, health and safety, and they also have uh, STASH, the storage techniques for art, science, and history collections, all of which are useful both for beginners and experienced professionals. The Association of Registrars and Collection Specialists is a relatively new organization that is working on getting more information available on its website, and they just launched a new website. There are currently short articles, including a list of state laws governing the laws for things found in collections, information on how to choose academic museum study programs, how to find a job, recommendations for basic references, a discussion forum, videos, and many, many links. The Canadian Conservation Institute website has a lot of excellent information on collections care, including a series of short articles similar to the conservagrams called CCI Notes for uh, Con Canadian Conservation Institute. And these are written for a broad audience. They uh, range from general information on storage environments to very specific information on the care of particular kinds of materials and objects. The site currently lists 125 CCI notes in 19 categories. And again, these are available for free download 
as a PDF. So a very useful site. And of course, the Connecting to Collections Care online community has many good resources. They are producing this webinar. They offer a virtual library of collections care resources, discussions, webinars, and other valuable information. If your institution does not have an integrated pest management program, it should. And for this, you can turn to the IPM Working Group, which hosts museumpest.net, which is a fantastic website with information on designing and implementing integrated pest management programs in museums, advice on monitoring and identifying pests, solutions to outbreaks, all sorts of other pest prevention and control information. And you can actually send in your photographs of your museum pests to get them identified. Those of you who work in natural history collections, or if you have natural history objects in your museum, will find the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections to be very useful. The most current publications on their web website are available only to paid members, but the older publications, I think older than two years, can be accessed by anyone. And the last resource that we wanted to mention is kind of a fun way to get your museum to start thinking about what collection management policies are and how they can improve collections care. And this is a board game that's based on the second edition of the book, Things Great and Small, Collection Management Policies. And you can download the game for free from the Museum Study LLC website. And uh, Brad Bredehoff of this website has, has kindly made it available. So this is a board game you can download, follow the instructions, put it together, and play it with your museum staff to start getting people to think about how policies play a role in collections care. We didn't include a lot of videos and webinars, uh, but with videos in particular, checking the information source is important. There are a lot of videos on the internet produced by commercial firms whose goal is to sell you a particular product. Some of these are OK. Most are fairly biased. So we particularly urge you to use cautions there. And we're not going to talk about any of the specific videos, but it is important to keep in mind who produced it and what was the motivation behind it. And I don't mean to say that you cannot trust commercial videos. Some of them are very good, uh, but do uh, approach them with an open mind and, and a healthy bit of skepticism. Being a member of a museum professional organization, I think, is very important. There are international, national, regional, and state-level organizations. Uh, this is the chance to network with your colleagues and meet people, get to know them, see what's coming up, what's new in the field. You make a lot of connections this way. I think attending these meetings is very important. The largest museum organization in the world is ICOM, the International Council of Museums based in Paris. They have a variety of resources uh, available for free on their website. The largest organization in the United States is the American Alliance of Museums, which has about 25,000 members. It holds an annual meeting that draws about 5,000 attendees each spring with a big expo. And the AAM has six regional organizations that meet in October. AAM meets in the spring. The regionals meet in October or November. Their meetings are usually, the regional meetings are usually smaller and a little more accessible. And uh, you'll be talking to people in your geographical area, which can also be very useful. And then most states have some kind of state level museum organization as well. So you need to look around and see what's available and what organizations you'd like to get involved with. I think that uh, networking is very important. Uh, our colleagues, uh, working with our colleagues is very important in museums. One of the things I like the most about the profession is how open people are to sharing the information they know. Making these connections can be very helpful in determining which collection care resources we want to use. And I think lifelong learning is also an important aspect of being a museum professional. And at this point, we will turn the microphone over to Karen, who is going to talk about care of digital collections. Thank you. So when I was first considering this webinar and collections care resources, I, I kept going back to this topic that has been a struggle for me, and that is finding information resources on the care of digital collections. Uh, as we just have been talking about, we know that our standards keep evolving. Uh, but anymore, the, the things that we are adding into our collection are evolving as well. So hopefully, I won't take us too far down the rabbit hole. But um, I really wanted to touch on 
the ways that our collections are evolving and what that means in regards to our collection care resources and the things that we look to for guidance. So as we progress, our objects are too, and we are becoming a paperless society. And don't get me wrong, I know that there, we are always going to have paper. Those things are always going to be there. Um, but like it or not, the way that we are recording the human record is changing, and that's going to affect the things that are coming into our collections and the way that we need to be preserving them. I, I'm sure we'll be collecting paper for long after our days. Um, but we, we need to also start considering how we're going to be taking in these digital objects and how we're going to care for them. So if you haven't already seen it in your collections, I assume that you will be seeing more digital donations coming your way. Obviously, those who are working with archival collections are going to see a lot more of this because we are so heavy on those paper documents and things that have been traditionally written down. But anybody really in a museum is going to have archival collection materials. I don't, I don't know of any museum that doesn't have letters and manuscripts, um, even photographs. Those are all things that are changing the way that are being produced and coming into our collection. So none of us are going to be immune to this change. Even if you don't see it in your actual collection objects, you're probably going to see it in your supporting documentation. Those of us who um, have been in natural history museums or those of you listening who are, uh, you may have previously gotten field notes on a paper notebook and now someone wants to hand you a thumb drive with all that same material. Uh, we all probably have uh, an experience with a reluctant donor who has some wonderful photographs, but they don't want to part with them. They may be willing to give you a digital copy, though. And all of these things that are supporting our collections, too, that, that provenance information, those are all just as important and need to be uh, preserved just the same as our three-dimensional and two-dimensional collection objects. So this is, uh, like I said, an area that I have really struggled to find good resources with. Fortunately, they are becoming more prevalent. You'll see some on the handouts. Um, but there really still isn't a whole lot out there. And a lot of what is out there um, isn't necessarily written for our audience. It's not written for the museum professional. It can be a little uh, too technological and not that easy to understand. Um, Many of our digital documents that we're seeing come into our collections are going to be subject to the same agents of deterioration that we have with our regular collection materials, but then we have some added things hit that are going to be added to the, the challenge of caring for those collections. Um, one of those things is going to be there's, there's a lot of information that's really kind of hidden behind our digital documents. If you think of um, even just like a PowerPoint presentation, those transitions for the slides, there might be sounds, there might be, there might be music, all those things, if you just simply make a paper surrogate of that, those aspects of the presentation are not going to be preserved. Uh, a photograph anymore, photographs uh, may never even see it to a paper form. They're born digital now. And Printing a copy of them is great, and that can be uh, another fantastic way to preserve it and to care for it. But there's a lot of information that doesn't print. Uh, if, you, if you look at the properties of a digital photograph, you'll see uh, the camera make and model. You'll see a time. You'll see a shutter speed. Um, if you have an iPhone, you know, if you, or probably any smartphone, but I know when I look at images on my iPhone, I can see um, navigational points. I can tell you the elevation I was at when I took that picture. So all that information um, also needs to be preserved, but it's not going to be preserved the same way in a paper form. So we are still subject to the same agents of deterioration, but we've got added challenges now when we are adding digital collections into our mix. Um, hardware, software, and operating systems. So these artifacts have to have something else to be used, right? It isn't the same as a textile or a piece of furniture or even a taxidermy mount that can kind of stand on its own. If you've got something that's in a digital format, you are going to need the hardware to run that, the software that's going to be able to understand the file types, and then the operating system that's going to make the hardware and the software all work together. 
So something that we are going to be running into is format obsolescence. We've already seen this, you know, we remember 8-tracks and floppy disks and zip drives and all sorts of those old media forms that we don't see every day anymore. Um, so we've got to think about data migration now. Pardon me, I had to go turn my light back on. It's on a timer, and I am not close enough to it. Um, so also we have a, a new problem of proprietary file formats. So you may have donors who are now bringing the same type of donations they would come to you in paper, but they're, they want to hand it to you on a disk, and you need to make sure that those are files that you can read. You could have um, Photoshop files or even uh, architectural drawings that are coming into you in a CAD file. It needs to be in a form that you know that you can actually read for you to be able to use it. There's also just the inherent decay of information. With our regular collections materials, we see that too. Everything eventually will decay, will break down, and there's nothing we can do but prevent and try and, try and keep it for longer. And we're going to see those same things in our digital collections, but we're going to see them in a little bit of a different way. Um, people will say data decay or data rot, bit rot, data degradation. We're all kind of talking about the same thing right there, and that's basically um, when, you, when you break it down to a digital document, um, it's made up of different bits, and if something happens to one of those, it's going to render your file unreadable. That could be a, something as simply as a, as a CD that gets exposed to too much heat it's going to render that use or useless. Or um, those, those magnetic documents, if, if that gets altered, you're not going to be able to read those anymore. So we do um, want to make copies, but we have to remember that duplication does not necessarily equal preservation. Um, we've all probably seen or are using those gold archival disks and they say there are some that'll last for 100 years, there are some that'll last for 300 years, and that's a great uh, way to preserve some information as long as we remember that you will still need the hardware that's going to operate that disk, the software that's going to read the files, and then of course an operating system that's going to make it all work together. Um, I don't know about you guys, but my personal computer doesn't even have a CD drive anymore, so we're already seeing a move away from that form of media. Um, so the chances are in 100 or 300 years for someone to be able to use that CD, it's uh, pretty unlikely. So we want to make sure that we are migrating our data uh, for the future of our collections. Okay, so as I said, duplication does not equal preservation, but there are still some safety principles that we can keep in mind when we are looking to uh, keep our data safe and, and our new digital collection objects. The first principle is locks, and that is lots of copies keep stuff safe. Um, and the three, two, one rule really kind of is very similar to that, goes off that, where um, you want to try and keep at least three copies in at least two file formats in at least one other geographic location. So for example, what I do if I get a digital photograph, I will save it as a JPEG, I'll save it as a TIFF file, and then I'll also save it as a PDF. And that is something that I have on a local server, and that's something that I also have on a cloud server. So when you look at that other geographic location, ideally that other geographic location isn't just down the street or another building on your campus, but um, someplace that's really in a, in a different area of the country that's going to be experiencing different natural disasters and those things. So um, that can actually be pretty easily achieved, though, with using cloud storage. Okay, so lots of new things to think about with our digital collections, but there is a silver lining. The storage for these things really does keep getting cheaper and cheaper. Most of us should be able to afford a removable hard drive or afford to use some form of cloud storage, and that can be as simple as Google Drive or Dropbox. Um, at some point, you'll, you'll reach a need to pay if you have enough material, um, but these are great ways to, to get it started. Um, and that cloud storage, like I said, is going to offer you this extra protection that we can't offer any of our old, um, sorry, not, well, they are old, but any of our other types of collection objects. I can't physically put a textile in two places, but I could do that with a digital object. 
um, and, and potentially save it from some, some form of natural disaster. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. So one thing we really just want to do is try and set a, stay ahead of the game. Uh, as I said, it's really been a struggle for me to figure out how to deal with this stuff and look for resources and find things to help me um, do this. But one thing that we can all easily do now is think about when these donations are coming in, is it a file format that you can even read? If someone's trying to give you Photoshop files or AutoCAD files, uh, maybe they can provide you that instead in a PDF, something that's easily readable for you, um, non-proprietary that's going to be available for a long time. And also think of a storage device. Um, there could be some really great information on that floppy drive but, or that floppy disk, but if you don't have a way to read it, um, it's really not going to do any good in your collection or it's going to cost you uh, money to try and get it migrated over to a new one. So it would be worth asking your donors if that's something they can do or saying, you know what, that's, that's great, we only take PDFs, we only take TIFFs, we only take JPEGs, things of that sort. Um, unfortunately, when you have a, a technological realm like this that is going to be changing so quickly, it means our resources for managing these digital collections are going to be changing just as quickly. So our best bet at this point, as I can see, is to look for our publications that have less lead time. Um, there are some conservagrams that have some digital collections material. They are actually uh, a bit older themselves, they're about 10 years, but they are well written and easy to read and will certainly get you in there and familiar with some of these new kind of digital collection preservation issues and um, just kind of familiar with the terminology. Another way that I think we can stay on top of caring for something that's kind of an emerging and changing aspect of our profession is professional development opportunities. Those are areas where we're going to be able to um, just meet with colleagues and interact with others and see what they are going to be doing in their collections. Maybe it'll work for you, issues they've seen, ways they've found to solve those problems. Um, so they can be a great way to network and learn about new collection resources. So we should talk a little bit about resources for professional development. Uh, it's important in probably all professions, but I think especially in ours that we stay on top of where our profession is going and we keep our knowledge current, not only for our own future but for the future of the collections that we are entrusted with. Uh, one thing that I always think about is when I'm, when I'm doing things, I don't ever want to be someone who my successors will shake their fist at and be like, oh, I can't believe she did that. So I want to make sure that I am staying on top of things and that no one in the future uh, will uh, disparage my name. So many professional development opportunities are out there for all of us to keep growing in our professions. And of course, you guys are doing it right now. There are lots and lots of webinars um, in this particular community that are great resources for you. There's going to be workshops and training courses. A lot of times I find that those are easiest when I go through my state or my regional museum organizations because they're closer to me and it's a, it's a lot easier for me to try to get to a workshop or a training course. That's also something that I would encourage you to think about even setting up on your own. If you've got a large amount of staff members that are interested in a particular topic and you all are looking to grow your knowledge and resources on, you may be able to bring in a consultant or a specialist to do your own workshop or your own training course. Um, it can be a more economical option rather than sending a whole bunch of people off to do something than to just have a person come to you. It could be a great way for you to build a relationship with other museums in your area who may have the same interest in a workshop or a training course. Um, and then they can also help you foot the bill for bringing in your specialist. If you want to take it even further, there are lots of educational options. So certificates and graduate degree programs. There's a pretty good amount of programs out there. Um, you are far less likely to find an undergraduate program for museum studies but most certainly there are, there are graduate programs and certificate programs 
in the Museum Studies Department and in the Archival and Library Science section as well. A good way to get you started if that's a, something that you're interested in and you think you might like to have a graduate degree or a certificate, um, there are program listings on Global Museum. There's also listings on the American Alliance of Museums website and the Society for American Archivists. All have um, program listings for things that you can try and find something close to you or some sort of program that's going to work out with your needs. Go back just real quick. Um, so I will say that um, you want to make sure that when you are looking into programs that you're, you're really looking to see what that particular program is going to be offering for you. Because there are a lot of programs out there with museum studies that are going to focus on a particular area of interest. And if you are in an art museum and looking to grow that specific knowledge, you know a program that's going to be particularly focused on natural history may not be a great fit for you. So make sure that when you're looking at those programs, you're really getting a good breakdown of course offerings and you're talking to instructors and, and knowing that it's going to meet your needs. And the same thing is going to go for um, archival programs. If you think you'd like to add some of that, uh, archival programs tend to be tucked in with either museum studies degrees or library and information science degrees. So you want to make sure you're looking at a program that isn't very, very heavily focused on, on the library aspect aspect and is only really offering you a few courses in archival and archival resources if that is the goal that, that you're looking for. Um, there are also fully online programs. Those are an option for both full graduate degrees and certificates. Uh, obviously there are some great advantages to those. You wouldn't have to um, probably move across the country, leave a job, something like that. Um, but there's also going to be a drawback to that type of learning environment as well. You won't have that face-to-face -face interaction with your cohort, with your professors, with um, just the other advantages that you get in being on a campus. Uh, a lot of times that's going to offer on-the-job kind of working experience and just great relationship building when you can be in that face-to-face -face environment. Um, it's a lot harder to network in an online community the same way that you can face-to-face -face, um, in the classroom. So you can look at those lists. There are many, many options. Um, you can always, of course, you know, ask others for advice, but like John said earlier, when you know, you'll see a question on the list serve that's like, oh, what's the best database program? Um, if, you, if you post that, like, oh, what's the best graduate program, it's going to be very far-reaching option or responses, and um, maybe not necessarily the most the most useful thing to look. Okay, so uh, for those of you who have downloaded the handouts, or when you do download the handouts, um, you'll realize that re there really is a good amount of information on there. Um, like John said, they're not exhaustive, but there's an awful lot there. So one thing I want to say is don't be overwhelmed by all of the resources that are on those lists. Um, there's a lot of good information, but you're going to have to figure out um, what works best for you. Maybe you have some particular projects that you know you need to beef up your, your research on and you want more resources on. Um, perhaps you're doing a storage move and you're having dreams of that or nightmares of that. So that's going to be an area that you can hone in and, and start to build your knowledge on. If you have areas of serious concern, maybe you do not have an uh, integrated pest management plan, then that's going to be a place for you to really focus on and, and try and get that um, knowledge under your belt so something that you can deal with. For me, I have my own physical bookshelf and I have a virtual bookshelf. So there are certain resources that um, are just invaluable that you've got to have, but there are going to be also ones that, that you can just build a browser bar for. Um, I have a lot of sites that I continually visit for um, collections care resources. I use a lot of conservagrams and the preservation leaflets, so I can just grab those real quick when I'm on my um, internet browser. 
but of course for really, really good ones you always want to print because you never know when a URL is going to change. Or for me, I like to just take them over to my um, processing table and have, have those resources right with me when I'm working. Um, so again, budget bookshelf. Many of us are, if not all of us, have a budget that we really need to stick to. Um, there are going to be those resources that are just completely invaluable that you'll want to try and budget for. Um, different for everyone, for me, you know that, that museum registration method, I have always gone back to that book. Um, Marie Malaro's A Legal Primer on Museum Collections, that is one that I have, um, you know, put colored sticky notes in and, and helped my administration uh, make points to the board with before. Um, those are just invaluable resources that I can't imagine not having. But I do, of course, take advantage of the online resources. We all have a budget. That's the reality. And of course, I have a bit of a, an advantage because I am in a, a library. Our archives are located in an academic library. So um, at some, someday I'll figure out who designed our stacks layout, and I will buy them a coffee because the closest shelf of books to my desk happens to be where all of the museum resources are. Um, so that's a great advantage for me. But even if you are not in a library, you can still take that same advantage. Um, even though I'm at a, pri a private university, we are a public building. Um, our catalogs are online. So if you just kind of wanted to shop around and see what a local library has, um, you should be able to look at their online catalog. Um, you should be able to visit and see what sorts of things that you can um, take advantage of there close to you, or if you want to just kind of preview a resource and see if you want to be purchasing it. Um, there's also uh, a wonderful thing called special borrowers, uh, something that my library does and I know a lot of other libraries also take part in is even if you're not connected to the university in some way, you can become a special borrower and get borrowing privileges from the library. And it may be through another university, it could even be through your own know, public library. Um, but I would just say that just, just know that even though you're not necessarily connected to some of those resources that are physically close to you, you may still be able to take advantage of them. All right. Um, so I think we will open this up to questions now. OK. Um, there haven't been very many questions. We're going to put a question for you guys into the chat box. I'm going to do it right now. Um, and so we'd like to know what's your favorite uh, collections care, uh, care resource. And then we'll start with these collections. Um, Linda Andrews-Lee, oh, Mike just made a really a nice thing. So here, you can put it in here. Um, does anyone know, I, I, John, um, when the next edition of Museum Registration Methods is coming out? Uh, we hope that that will be in uh, December of this year, or of next year, of 2019. Uh, it's being uh, edited by Tony Kaiser of the World War II Museum and I. And we are, so far, we're on track for that. But we're uh, a long way to go yet. And it'll depend partly on the publisher schedule. But we tentatively have it planned for late November or December of 2019. OK. Um, and. When does the Preventive Conservation book, the Elkins Norris book, come out? And where can people get it? OK, I'm going to post over in the chat box the uh, link to the website for the book. And as far as when it's going to come out, I do not know. Uh, I had expected it, frankly, to be out already. And I've not checked with Lisa and Chris to see what the current a hold up is on things. OK. But it, it, it should be out very soon. It was, it was, as far as I know, it was due out this year. OK. 
Um, okay, so I, I just put this link in that will get you to the web page for the book, and it might uh, provide more up-to-date information. Okay. Um, and then uh, Jean-Luc Vincent said that there are emulators where you can put stuff in and it will emulate even back to the ENIAC. Um, but he says they're not accepted by the software industry for copyright reasons. Um, that's just a comment. And Amy Hammond said, any suggestions on how to stay updated on materials? Bubble wrap and glassine, for example, are now controversial. <clears throat> um, so on I think, that, I would, yeah. oh, go ahead. you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Karen. So, no, you go well, ahead, Karen. For, for one thing, I would say, you know, when we're staying up to date on uh, some of those really useful resources like uh, museum registration methods, um, those obviously those those kind of older older types of, of materials aren't going to be mentioned. Um, and even just looking into what is available on our trusted vendors, uh, the sorts of things that that they are selling, but we still have to be a little bit careful with that too. That um, some of those things may, may be hanging on longer than they should. And that's also the kind of question you can post to a, a, a site like Museum L or the collection stewardship list, used to be the registrar's list, where you can post that out and you'll get responses back from your professional colleagues, not just from the general public, that can tell you that, uh, yes, that bubble wrap is still considered a no-no because it's primarily PVC plastic and the bubbles deflate and that kind of thing. So that's the kind of thing where it's, it's, it's probably advisable to check with colleagues if, if you don't know which literature to go to. And you can always post questions like that in our forum. Um, and as I said, get an answer from a, a conservator. So right. go to our C2C. website, sign up for the new one. Yep. D John, we're, we're now connecting to Color. Care, C2C is 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 no longer. It became. Oh, I'm a, sorry. I'm that's sorry. okay. Okay. Um, there See was how a fast question. It's changed? <laughs> yeah, and and I just want to point out we have about almost a thousand resources in our resource library. So, um, I I try to collect resources from elsewhere and from us. We also have now, I think, about 130 webinar recordings that you can listen to for free. So um, take advantage of what we have. Um, let's see. Does anyone know of a graduate program for both library and museum studies? The only one I know of is one I teach in, so I'm a bit prejudiced, but Kent State University has a museum studies program in their School of Information and Library Sciences. The uh, museum component, the museum studies component is all online, but if you look at the, uh, the, the iSchool at Kent State, you can find information there. There may be others. I am not aware of any others out there that are both library and museum studies. Karen, do you know of any? I, I don't. I do know like at the, at the University of Denver we have both programs and you will very often see a mix of students going between those two classes. So you may find that there's a school that offers a library science degree and a museum studies degree that are willing to work with you on your curriculum and your interests uh, that would let you kind of meet both needs. Okay. Um, Stephen Toth asked if there are um, questions, if there are books that you can recommend on theory and philosophy of, the, of collecting artworks. I'll toss that one to Karen. I, I don't do art. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm going to say that um, I'm, I'm sure there are things out there. Um, I, I did start in art history, but I'm, I'm so far down in a pretty strict collections management uh, path that it's not something I am, I am up to date on. Yeah, I think there's so. been a lot uh, published along that, those lines in the last 10, 15 years. Um, yeah. Well, there's historic overviews as well. And, uh, yeah. And, and that whole thing is changing a great deal. Um, okay, Nora Schneider uh, yeah. says, 
what would be the top resources you would recommend for someone who just became a part-time collections manager of a small historical society who has a background in history but not a museum background? Go to go to Connecting to Collections Care website. <laughs> we have yeah, definitely. Them. And that's and that's Nora, you're exactly the kind of person our website is for. And our whole and program you, is for. You might also look at AASLH, the American Association right. for State and Local History, and we and you take a, a look at the handout Karen and I have on the basic uh, library, the basic bookshelf. And you can go through those and, and see what titles look like they might be apt. Yeah. And you could look at the ASLH program, Small Museum Pro, uh, which mm -hmm. is a, an accreditation program for people in small museums that are just in your situation. And that was started in New Mexico. <laughs> so uh, also, Nora, I assume everyone can see, can see the poll responses, right? So um, as you look through those, you see a lot of references to the National Park Service conservagrams, um, mm -hmm. Canadian Conservation Institute, and of course that museum registration methods. And I think if those are things that you seek out. Um, I've always really loved the way that the information is just presented in those. Um, it's, it's very easy to understand and implement, um, pretty straight to the point and very, very helpful, I think, for anyone at any point of their career, but I think those would be some really great places to start. Um, Bridget Jensen <clears throat> says, how would one begin reassessing collections, policies, and systems? There are a lot of steps and an overwhelming amount of reputable information. What is step one? I think step one is to take a look at your present policies and see if they're working. Are they doing what they're supposed to do or not? And begin assessing them one by one. And so don't think of it as all of your policies, but break them down to the individual things, the accessioning policy, the acquisition policy, the collection use and access. And, and go through them one by one and see what's going on. Make a list of the problems that your museum has and see what policies you need. Policies should be written to uh, help you resolve problems. So if you have problems, you either need to rework the policy that addresses that problem or perhaps write one to address it. There, if I can uh, toot my own horn a little bit, there is some information on how to do that in uh, Things Great and Small, the uh, managing collect uh, Museum Collections Management Policies, which is now out in a second edition. Yeah, and also, um, you could take a look at the STEPS program from ASLH, which has a workbook which is worth the price of admission because it goes down, it breaks all these things down into small steps and says, if you are at this level, then you're this, and it's, it's very good. Um, Bailey Yoder said, we recently acquired a collection from a separate museum, and it's never been properly cataloged or stored. We are getting a brand new storage for the collection, but what would be step one be in assessing the condition of the collection and how to properly organize? Um, definitely look at Angela Kipp's book. Yeah, and I think Angela would tell you start with an inventory to figure out what yeah. you've got before you go any further. Take photographs, and then you can start breaking it out by materials or storage needs or what looks like it needs a lot of work. But I'd start with that initial inventory so you, you can figure it out. And um, Bailey, there is a Connecting to Collections Care webinar that Angela did in 2000, mm -hmm. two years ago. So um, check our, our website and you'll find it. And it's called um, Assessing or Getting a Handle on, on Accessioned Things. Um, I, I would also it's, add for It's the for, same title as your book. Yeah. Managing previously unmanaged collections. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go, go ahead, Karen. 
um, if it's possible for Bailey. Uh, of course, if, if you're taking on a collection that's previously um, unmanaged, you may be uh, also welcoming in some other pests and things like that that you do not want to have come into your new storage collection area. Right. So if you could do some <laughs> assessment and some inventory in an area away from um, everything else, that be that would be great in case you are ending up inventorying um, some some live things you didn't realize were coming in with your donation. Uh, great point. Right. And Elizabeth Cesar um, says, um, not sure if people saw the, the collection, the question about the whether or not people have played Monopoly the month. You'll have to say it, John. No one can pronounce it. It's fine. Yeah. Monopoly. Um, <laughs> John's game and what they're results were. Um, so you could put that in the chat box if you have. Um, yeah, and I I, um, I want to remind people about the evaluation. I'm going to stick it over here. Evaluations are really important. And there was a question about packing materials. And um, I wanted to say that in December, we're going to do a webinar on um, packing materials for moving and storage. And uh, that's going to be done by somebody from BoxArt. It should be really good. And then our second course, which is coming up in November, is going to be on different aspects of moving museums, on aspects that aren't usually covered. So that should be coming up, uh, be posted fairly soon. So keep an eye on the website. And just to remind everybody, the rec any recording, if you no longer see it on our website, see the advertising slide, it's been moved into the archives. And everything, the PowerPoint slides, the recording, all handouts are then available. And you can listen to them at your leisure. And what else? And the other question I get asked is, why don't I, I publish uh, that webinars are happening until about a month before they happen? And the reason is that I've found that if I do that, people sign up, and then they forget that it's happening, no matter how much we remind them. So they always get posted about a month before. So that's why. Um, let's see, are there any other questions here? And uh, Lori Benson said, send questions to the Connecting to Collections Care Forum and do that. Sign up for the new forum. We're happy to answer questions. I have an army of young conservators that answer questions. And if they don't know an answer offhand, they will research it and get back to you. And I remind them that the people that we're serving are small and mid-sized institutions, and so the answers need to be appropriate for the people we serve. Um, Stefan Toff in Prague says, do you recommend any collections management software? Yeah, that's going to depend entirely <clears throat> on the collection and how it's used. I don't think you can make any recommendations for one size fits all. I would say that you want to look for a relational database. You want to look for one that allows plenty of room for growth. And you want one that allows you to do things like loan forms, condition reports, uh, link ancillary information back to your objects, and that do, do uh, lots of kinds of searches. But in there, I would not want to recommend any one product. There are a lot available right now. But you do want to shop very carefully. Not all of them do the same thing. And they vary quite a bit in price. So John, what about um, when people first began having databases, they would have um, the board treasurer's husband, who was a software engineer, design a, a, <laughs> a collection. And now he's dead. and uh, there are only two people who can run it. What, yeah, and what that's, do you recommend yeah, about that? Yeah. Uh, that's why I think going with commercial databases is, is much better than having them written in-house, because frequently the designer 
uh, writes it in a way that it makes it difficult for to transfer the data into another database, you should assume that no, no database will last forever. At some point, you will need to transfer that information into another database. And so I would look for one that is on a known platform and will be fairly easy to transfer if you can make that judgment. I would certainly, in most cases, uh, avoid in-house written databases because they tend to be so institutional specific that they can't be transferred later. Yeah, thanks. I will, um, I will certainly agree as someone who, who inherited a homegrown database and then, and then had to, to transfer it to something that was commercially available. Um, you always want to leave your successors and you know, your collection objects that you care so much about um, in good hands, and part of that is going to be uh, a way that people can gain access to information without you. If you are the training manual for, for your database, um, and you decide that you know maybe you win the lottery and you're going to move to an island, then you need to you need to leave people with a way to to learn that system. And and going with a commercial system is a way to to ensure that other people are going to be able to operate it as well. Yeah, I, I tell my students all your database and all of your procedures and processes and collection management should be able to pass the bus test. And that is, if you walk out the door and get run over by a bus, can someone else come in to your office and figure out what you were doing without going through an enormous amount of work? Is sh your operation should be transparent and easily understood bec because people are ephemeral and the collections are not. I, yeah. I can also attest to remembering you telling us that, and I have throughout <laughs> my entire career always thought, okay, is someone going to be able to understand this if I do not walk in the door tomorrow? Yeah, not from a bus, right. but winning the lottery. <laughs> okay, right. So, Sean, Vincent said my problem is not so much homegrown data uh, with homegrown database as with software company uh, companies that are too small and eventually fold, leaving customers in the lurch. Well, yes, that's this is a problem. Kind of like, kind of like buying an automobile. It's not going to last forever. You are, you do need to budget for replacing your database. You know, probably within five, six, seven years, or at least, and do frequent upgrades because when you are left in the lurch, you need to have that data in a form that you can transfer it to. And the smaller companies do tend to go under faster, but that can happen with any database. And, and the, the solution with that is picking something that is very standard and staying in touch with the, with the database company. Make sure you do all the upgrades, but keep planning for that transfer. It is, it's an ongoing expense. Right. Yeah, and, and of course, when you're looking at those those uh, software systems, making sure that they have an easy way for you to extract all that information that you've put into it. So even if the company doesn't fold, but you decide that there's another program that's really going to serve your needs better, if you can export that information into a usable form. Um, that's for, for me when I traveled from, from a homegrown database to, to another one. The only reason I could do that was because I did luckily have the ability to export all of the information we had in a usable form that could be uploaded. So when you're searching for collections management software, make sure that you've got that element that you can get your data back out. Yeah, that's right. So um, I think we're going to call it a, a day. and. Please remember to fill in the evaluation. I really appreciate that. And let's see, we have we have another thing. Not well, all we information just, is online. Yeah, we just wanted to remind you that not everything is online. A good library is going to have information in print that you will not find digitized. And I think our last message is the one thing that makes the museum feel so interesting to us, which is you never stop learning. Right, right. and. So thank you all very much. Uh, join us next month. Uh, early in the month, we're going to have a webinar on feathers. Later in the month, we're going to start our first course on X